All right, I guess we can go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming. And a quick question, who was here last year? Just a few, okay, everybody else, you're in for a treat. And by treat, I mean watch at what point you're eating food today because some of this stuff is gonna be truly horrifying. So here we go. So let's jump way back. For those of you who've been here for the prior talks, we've gone through the history of medicine from antiquity up until the Renaissance. We've gone through different modes of what people thought disease and illness actually were. And we've talked about how pharmacology and therapeutics have developed over time. And today we're picking up one of the threads that we left really exposed really early on, and that's the history of surgery and actual physical intervention in people's illnesses. So moving forward, we're gonna introduce a few of the people that you haven't heard of before, and we're gonna revisit a few of the people who've already been brought up multiple times during this course. So first up, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine. In terms of actual surgery, Hippocrates did not have a great deal to say apart from asking people to uh, consider bleeding, purging, having uh, emetics given to patients. In terms of surgery, his most famous quotation was about actually cutting for bladder stones. So bladder stones and kidney stones were a problem throughout history, but bladder stones in particular were really nasty. You have ma kind of really massive stones develop in the bladder, block the flow of urine, and eventually kill people. Now, one of his famous uh, articles that was in the Hippocratic Oath was that people would not cut for the stone. Now, part of that was considered to be that it was a really tough procedure and it was really violent. It did a lot of trauma. If you guys right here, right now, were going to try to remove someone's bladder stone, how would you go about it? Just visualize what approach you'd take to get to the bladder. Even if you haven't had anatomy all the way through, visualize how you'd go about it. And then let me tell you that the approach they took was the perineal approach. Basically, they went through the scrotum or genitalia and dug up to get to the stone. This is all way pre-anesthesia, by the way. And then yank the stone out with some pliers or something like that. I would have gone super pubic, but that's just me. <laughs> so it was a process that was disavowed by the Hippocratics, but one of the more interesting things is it wasn't disavowed because of the violence and difficulty of the procedure. It's because there were already medical professionals who we would call lithotomists who did this already. There was already a group of people who had this procedure as their main activity. Now, we already mentioned that in Greek culture, you weren't allowed to dissect and you weren't even really allowed to cut into people. It was considered to be kind of a cultural taboo. So what's hilarious in a way is these lithotomists would come around and they would cut people for their urinary stones, but they'd get paid for it. The family would pay them in advance, but because these people were defiling their relative, they would throw rocks and stuff at them after they'd done it. So they'd agree to have them do the procedure, but then they'd chase them out of town. Be like, how dare you cut my grandpa? And here's your money. So, <laughs> so it was a very weird relationship with cutting into the body and needing to have these procedures done. And to a degree, those conflicts between needing to cut into the body but wanting to avoid doing it will stick with us for a while. And just for a moment, take a second and reflect. Surgery is a weird thing. It's weird to say, I'm gonna cut this person and they'll be better when I'm done. It's a weird thing to think, yet it's true. So our next big name after Hippocrates, as you may recall, is Galen. Galen did a lot of anatomical research, really took the Hippocratic teachings, consolidated them, put them on a firm experimental standing. Now amongst the bad things he did is that he developed a system that he thought was flawless and propagated it for millennia thereafter. And people really didn't question the findings of it and they didn't focus on his experimental results as much as they focused on what he said was true. What's interesting is Galen, who wrote about almost everything, wrote very little about surgery. It was mentioned, he talked about anatomical dissections involving animals, in experiments involving animals, but he didn't do a ton when it came to human medicine and human surgery. Generally, his therapeutics were fairly conservative. They involved adjusting the humors through bleeding, sweating, purgatives, and so forth, but he never really took that anatomical knowledge that he gained by animal dissection and tried to put it to work surgically. And that's additionally strange when you think that he was the physician to gladiators. 
One of his earlier jobs as a physician was working with the gladiators in an arena where you'd think surgical intervention might actually be something that would be useful. So Galen is kind of a lost opportunity in the history of surgery. Although, actually, let me back up real quick. One thing that he did do, which we're also going to see propagating throughout time, is he distanced physical activity and labor from intellectual activity and kind of that philosophic knowledge of medicine. And even to this day, just take a moment once again, a little thought experiment. Think of what pops in your head when you hear physician. And compare that to the stereotype you hear when I say orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, I heard a couple of giggles. Good. Our orthopedic surgeon. Now, orthopedic surgeons are brilliant people, but is that what you think of when you think of an orthopedic surgeon? Give me a word you think of when you hear orthopedic surgeon. What's that? Buff. I like buff. I was gonna say bam, bam, bam would be mine. And if you ever get to watch some orthopedic surgeries, they're brutal. They're very manual in nature, and in truth, intellectual and manual go together. Putting your hands and your mind to work is the way things get done. But in the Western tradition, they've been very separate from each other for a long time. And they're still separate in a lot of people's minds. And Galen propagated that and kept it going. So as we discussed, once the Greek and Roman empires had fallen, the majority of high learning, scientific, mathematic, literature, everything else, moved into the Islamic empires prior to moving back into Europe after the uh, Mongol invasions that uh, wiped out Baghdad and Constantinople, uh, Constantinople a bit later, but Baghdad and Damascus. So amongst the very, very wide-ranging Islamic empires, which basically spread from the Middle East, Turkey, all the way across northern Africa into Spain, now, anyone who's not a history buff here, you might be a little surprised to find out that a lot of Spain was under Muslim control for nearly 700 years. And the Muslim empires at this time were very high culture areas. Even though different rulers or caliphs existed in different places, they all had very, I don't want to say enlightened, but they had very strong intellectual foundations and a lot of scholarly work going on. And additionally, Christian and Jewish scholars were supported in these uh, caliphates and are allowed to do a lot of good work. And amongst all the scientific work that was done, surgery was really low on the list, sadly, because much like the Greeks and Romans, in the Islamic empires, cutting into the body was considered to be something that was not really acceptable. So surgery had to adapt. And in the Muslim uh, caliphates, the surgical technique of choice became cautery. And the big name here is Al-Zawari, also known as Abu Qasis. And he basically worked in Spain, area called Cordoba, which is now just part of Spain in general. But he worked on cautery as a way to treat wounds. Since we weren't allowed to cut, it was also not really allowed to suture. But you were able to use cautery as a way to deal with that. So if you've ever heard the, the phrase, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. That's how these guys were with cautery. Everything that they saw, they were looking at, OK, how can I burn this out of existence? How can I get something to burn this and make it better? And they developed some pretty good techniques with it, but there's only so much you can do by charring wounds, charring sores, and things like that. Now, much like many of the people in the course, he worked and did a lot of writing and left it for posterity. And this cautery-only paradigm actually stuck around for a long time, not only in the Islamic empires, but even in Europe. In medieval Europe, Muslim scholars were the high culture sources of authority. And medieval writers in Europe would actually give themselves Arabic pseudonyms to actually make their books more popular. They'd actually try to convince people they were writing from a Muslim controlled area so that people would think, oh, they must know what they're talking about because they're coming from this high culture area. So that was actually a little bit of a shift that not everyone appreciated after his story developed. Now, another thing that Abu Qasis al-Zuhari did was he described a lot of the tools that were used in cautery and also eye surgery. So eye surgery, as we mentioned in the last uh, session, was one area where the Muslim surgeons excelled. Apparently, moving stuff around in the eye was considered not to be cutting open the body. So they were actually able 
socially to go about that and actually come up with some treatments for glaucoma and other problems caused by clouding of the lens and so forth. Now, one thing that uh, he did that stuck around for a long time was talk about cautery. And it wasn't until much later, in the 1500s, that a French surgeon named Ambrose Paré, more on him later, came up with the idea of actually ligating arteries and veins instead of just trying to burn them to the point where they would stop hemorrhaging. All right, so we brought up Europe. What was going on in Europe at this time? The people who dealt with wounds were not the physicians. Remember that physicians were these high status people. Who was here at the last talk? Oh, a lot of people, great. So what were they doing? They were staring at jugs full of urine and trying to discover what was wrong with somebody based on that wheel of urine and exactly what discoloration was manifesting which bodily humor being out of whack. The barbers and barber surgeons were lower status, which meant they were tasked with doing things. And funny enough, when you do things, you actually have more know-how than people who have theoretical, academic-only knowledge. And I know the irony of me, a professor, standing up here and saying that, but we'll just keep moving on. So barbers and barber surgeons were kind of a weird amalgam. It was kind of tough to keep track of who exactly did what. Essentially, physicians took care of the intellectual diagnostic aspect of medicine, and barbers did the actual treatments and gathering of samples and things of that nature. And what's interesting is barbers drew blood, they gave the emetics, and they actually cut hair. That was one of their other things, which we think of barbers as doing now. They eventually added wound healing to their repertoire and trying to help people get better from wounds. And if you live in an illiterate society, how are you going to go about advertising to people that you can treat their wound? You might take a bloody gauze bandage and wrap it around a pole and stick it outside your door. And that's where the barbacle pole comes from. It was basically an advertisement for people to come here and get your wounds treated by this barber. So barbers, being people who were actually treating people, were really well poised to take a quantum leap forward in terms of therapeutics and treatment. But the Council of Tours in the 1100s basically shut that down. It forbade clergy, and that includes monks and other, anyone who's taken orders, any kind of clerical orders, from practicing surgery. Now, back in the Middle Ages, who were the people who could read and write? The clergy. So essentially, barbers and barber surgeons became a forced, illiterate group of people. They had skills, but they were craft skills. They were passed on from master to apprentice. They weren't written down. They certainly weren't experimented on and there was no real drive to improve the techniques or bring knowledge from other places in. So barbers and barber surgeons did a lot of work, but they weren't able to pass on any of their expertise, and they weren't able to record it and improve upon it for posterity. So as time went on, barbers started to get a little bit jealous of the physicians. Physicians would walk around, and they would wear long robes. And a lot of barbers walking around in their short robes thought, huh, sure would like to have a long robe and be high status like these people. So we developed academic barbers and academic barber surgeons who basically mimicked the physicians at the time and would start reading Latin, reading their Galen and their Aristotle and trying to come up with theoretical underpinnings for how surgery and barber surgery would work. And more craft barbers, barbers of the short robe, would actually do all the standby day-to-day -day treatments. So we think about long robe and short robe and how that's kind of silly and superfluous. What kind of coat do you guys get to wear when you go to the clinic again? So all these things have little echoes up until the present day. So the short coat versus long coat doctors, yeah. At least it's not that you're forever stuck with a short coat because you're scum and you work with your hands. You eventually graduate to that long coat as time goes by. So essentially, the surgeons split into the academic long robe surgeons and the more down to earth short robe surgeons. And we got a real split eventually where barbers would wear the short robe, they'd have the blue and white pole, they would pull teeth they would cut hair, and they'd occasionally help treating some wounds. And the academic surgeons would be the ones with the red and white pole, and they were more in universities and more learned society. 
And I've even seen barber poles that were red, blue, and white, and I have really no idea what that signifies, other than having all of it together, or maybe just being patriotic. Thank you, that was a joke, I appreciate it. <laughs> so it's easy to think that medieval medicine and medieval surgery was just this seamlessly negative kind of cesspool of ignorance. It really, there were good things that happened. We probably don't know a lot of the good things that could have happened at this time. But one bright spot was a French surgeon named uh, Guy de Chalac. He was a uh, surgeon who studied at Montpellier and then eventually went to, uh, Oh, where'd he go? He studied in Bologna to get his terminal degree, and he was the surgeon to a series of popes in Avignon. Now, again, I've only learned this recently as I've gotten more into general history, probably from just following this, but when you think of the pope, what city do you think of? Vatican. And what city is the Vatican in? Rome. Vatican City is in Rome. But there was a series of, there was a, pardon me, a period of about 80 years where the papacy actually moved to southern France in Avignon, and he was the surgeon to a series of the Avignonese popes. He actually caught the plague as it came through, and he survived, and he was able to document his progression of symptoms and document how the plague affected him as he got sicker and sicker and eventually recovered. He basically diagnosed the difference in the people he saw who had the bubonic plague, where your lymph nodes would swell and burst, versus the pneumonic plague, where it would affect your lungs and you'd bleed out very quickly. He actually uh, kept one of the popes alive by saying, yeah, to avoid the plague, you should stay locked indoors and have two fires going at all times to drive away the miasmas. Now, it didn't help the miasmas, but if you're a flea-carrying rat, are you going to go into this overheated furnace of a room with two giant bonfires burning all the time? No, so he was quarantined, had the fires going, and we had inadvertent, you know, effective treatment of the plague by just shutting him away, quarantining, and making it an unattractive area to be in. He wrote a uh, canon of medicine and was generally regarded as a pretty high point for European surgery up until the Renaissance and later Enlightenment eras. And as I mentioned, he was very, very familiar and very respectful towards the medical advances and medical uh, discussions that were coming out of the Arabic world. And being in France, he was actually very close to the areas of Cordoba and what's now Spain, and was able to get quite a bit of the information that was coming from that area and try to apply it to his uh, clients and to the Pope. Oh, sorry, one last thing. He did maintain one major surgical error that was propagated by Galen but kept around from medieval times. And that was that if you had a wound healing properly, there would be thick whitish pus associated with it. Now this thick whitish pus is actually gonna be caused by staph. It's a staphylococcal, inf sorry, yeah, staphylococcal infection. It doesn't tend to spread, and in terms of infections, it's one of the nicer ones to have in that it doesn't go centrally. However, it was thought that not only was this pus okay after an incision, it was propagated that it had to be there after an incision. So if you sutured somebody up and they had a wound that was clean, a little reddish, and no pus, oh man, no pus. Better cut it back open and scrape it a little bit and hope it gets some pus. So they actually would make people redo surgeries until they had pus form, which we now know means bacterial infection. So again, we lost quite a few people to the idea that this praiseworthy or laudable pus was a necessary step in the process of healing. More on that when we get to Joseph Lister and antisepsis in a little bit. So the surgeons and barber surgeons were fairly well established in their camps. And along comes Ambrose Paré, French surgeon. Now this is his book, oh, pardon me. The method of curing wounds and by means of gunshot and other injuries. Now this figure is a pretty classic figure in medicine and there's various permutations of it in different books. It's called a wound man. Now, if you look at this book and see this guy on the cover, what do you, what do you think of? What's that? Edward Scissorhands. Edward Scissorhands, I like it. Uh, the hands aren't quite there. Doesn't have kind of, a, maybe a Johnny Depp kind of face going on. What else do you think? Surgery? 
this cover is basically an advertisement for the book. It's saying, if you buy this book, you will learn to treat these things. An arrow through the thigh, a spear through the thigh, a club to the head, a sword cut to the shoulder. It's basically an advertisement for what sort of treatments are going to be present inside. And this was written by Ambrose Poiré, so it's a very effective advertising technique. And essentially, he began as a very poor French peasant who wanted to become a surgeon. He could not pass the examinations or even attend university to join the long-robed academic surgeons. So he did what a lot of people did. He joined the military and became a barber surgeon for the military. So essentially, this low-class military background gave him an opportunity to see many kinds of wounds, many kinds of problems, and find out ways that they could be treated. And so he worked with the French army, and his big breakthrough came during his wartime service. He wrote many books, and his books became a surgical mainstay for a long time. Now, his big breakthrough came when they were treating uh, soldiers who had been wounded with rifle barrels and uh, gunshot. Gunshot was relatively new. And at the time, the prevailing theory was, when someone got shot and they had a lead ball inside them, the lead ball was a problem, but the bigger problem was gunpowder poisoning. It was thought that the gunpowder residue on that shot was poisoning the wound and that you had to get that poison out of the wound. And the method of choice was to pour boiling oil into the bullet hole. Yeah. So being the conscientious surgeon and well-studied student that he was, he would do this. However, one day, there were so many wounded, he ran out of oil, and he was worried. He wanted to treat his patients well. He wanted to treat these soldiers well, but he couldn't do it, so he had to come up with something else. He came up with a poultice of, I think it was eggs, which actually have antimicrobial properties to them. There's lysozyme in egg whites, as well as some turpentine and just some other stuff he could throw together, and he put it on the wound, and he was convinced he'd murdered his patients, that he'd really done them a disservice because he ran out of boiling oil to pour in their wounds. But the next couple days, he looked at their wounds, and by, by all means, it was better. His treatment was better. And unlike most people up to this point, that made an impression on him. He said, this needs to be something that's done more of. I need to actually respond to the fact that I see a better way to go about things than the authority that's been passed down. So he took that experimental approach and ran with it. And he did lots of experiments on more effective ways to treat people. And that extended to doing things like getting out of cautery. Cautery was the big way that you go about treating any kind of wound. And he reintroduced ligatures, trying to tie off vessels that were bleeding rather than just burning them until they were done hemorrhaging. Oh, what else? Yeah, he uh, did a lot of surgical research on different topics. and. Uh, worked on amputations, better ways to do those, looking for actual ways. Yeah, I keep looking up because there's a screen there, and this is painful, so there we go. And essentially, got better at treating people by questioning what used to be done. The old method for curing hiatal hernias was, not a hiatal hernia, pardon me, an inguinal hernia, was to castrate the person. Is that gonna solve anything? No, it's going to make things worse. You've got a loop of bowel in the scrotum and you cut out the person's testicles. That doesn't do anything, and it, if anything, it's going to glance through the intestines at the same time. So little things like being willing to look at alternative methods was a huge advance in the 1500s. And Ambrose Paré brought that experimental mentality to surgery, just as William Harvey and Andreas Vesalius had brought that approach to medical research and the actual investigation of anatomy. So as a military surgeon, he was fantastically capable. He was very well known as being a surgeon who not only could treat people well, but actually cared about the patients he had. Now, if you think surgeons today have a reputation for being distant and not quite so personable, it was way worse back in the day because they basically knew everyone they treated was probably going to die anyway, and they had to distance themselves from it and were really well known for not caring. Ambrose Poiré cared, and people knew it. He was actually smuggled into a besieged city by the French army, and when he got inside, they were so happy they paraded him around town, like basically crowd surfed him around the entire town because they knew somebody was there who might actually help 
them or their wounded comrades. So over time, he eventually became so well known that he had to be acknowledged by the King of France. Now I'm gonna get back to that in a moment, but first, war and surgery are sadly really tightly linked. Warfare is about the only time you see a large number of similar injuries caused by similar weaponry that you have to learn to treat and you have to do it really quick. So the, the connection of the military and surgery is very intimate and whether that's a pleasant thought or not, a lot of advances in surgery come from military, um, kind of changing military weaponry and tactics. Now, throughout history, most of the time, if you were wounded on the battlefield, you were just left there and you died, or maybe people came and stabbed you and took your stuff, or if you were very lucky, a comrade would kill you quickly to get you out of your misery. In the 1500s, we have Poiré introducing ligature to deal with the large number of lacerations, but also gunshot and cannon injuries that were starting to accrue. Now, I'm gonna back up real quick. The cannon and gunshot injuries were things that were capable of actually removing a limb entirely. Now a sword or a bayonet or a halberd might remove a limb, but more often than not, they're just gonna cause deep lacerations. They're not gonna remove it entirely. When you have a limb that's just off, you have to deal with it, and ligature is one of the better ways. In the 1700s, 1770s, the American Revolution had a big bump in hygiene practice because George Washington actually had the troops inoculated for smallpox, which let the Revolutionary Army stay in the field longer than it might have otherwise. Uh, Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War in the 1800s pioneered modern nursing. Nursing was a very low status and low efficacy kind of a career up until that point. And Florence Nightingale actually brought nursing into the forefront and allowed people to have better hygiene, better bedding, and just actual care when they were recuperating. In the 1860s, during the Civil War, we actually had surgical anesthesia come into place as well as patient transport from the battlefield. We actually had people removed from the battlefield to be treated in hospitals. And even though a lot of people were treated with really crude things like field amputation, they were at least picked up and moved somewhere, which was not the case prior to that. And during the Franco-Prussian War, uh, vaccination once again got used. Inoculation with smallpox in the Revolutionary War was because uh, was using smallpox crusts to try to get a minor infection to take place. Vaccination with cowpox crusts was used in the Franco-Prussian War, leading to more uh, inoculations and immunity to smallpox. Now, 1814, sorry, 1914, in the World War I, facial reconstruction and dealing with amputated limbs and coming up with prostheses became more common, and that's something that continues to this day. Better and better technology is being brought to that, but that really only became prominent in the First World War. Uh, the Korean War and Vietnam War, rapid evacuation from the battlefield became a thing. Getting people off the battlefield had happened, but rapid evac with helicopters or even ambulances in the field was brought on in Vietnam and in the Korean War, as well as an understanding of PTSD. Now, PTSD is about the furthest thing from surgery we can get. It's a psychological problem brought about by intense stress for a prolonged period of time. It actually has gone by a lot of different names. In World War I, it was called shell shock. And in uh, World War II, it was called battle fatigue and eventually we get to post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, you may notice these terms get more and more sanitized as time goes by, but at the same time, understanding that it's a real thing that's not due to a weakness of character or due to any sort of deficiency in the person on the receiving end of it has been a long time coming. It's been a very long process to get people to understand that psychological damage from war is actual damage. It's not just some byproduct. And then currently, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have brought us a lot of understanding about how concussions, contusions, and diffuse axonal injury manifest and have long-term problems for the people on the receiving end. Concussive blasts, um, improvised explosive devices have brought those into fairly high relief in recent wars. Now, one little tidbit I came across is, in addition to surgical intervention, one problem in warfare throughout history has been hygiene making sure people are actually not gonna get sick on the battlefield or get sick 
from what they're fed because you have a lot of rotting food around and supply lines are hard to maintain. So real quick, I want everybody to shout out an idea. What's the first American war to lose more soldiers to actual combat than hygiene or food related problems? Just throw out an idea. What's the first American war where that happened? Vietnam, Vietnam? okay. Iraq, Iraq? okay. Civil War. Civil war? Spanish American, okay. Well, it was during my lifetime, the first Gulf War, 1990 is the first time the actual war and the battles involved had more casualties associated than getting people supplied and treated during that time. All right, sidebar over. Let's jump back to Ambrose Paré, France, 1500s. So, he had gone through an experimental process of making surgery better. This was acknowledged by the King of France, Henry II, and he was basically shoehorned into high status and given standing with the academic surgeons. They waived their Latin exam, which I'm sure just hurt them dearly, and allowed him to join the academic surgeons and take a place at court alongside Henry II. Now, one of the more famous things that happened in medical history and the history of surgery is that Henry II was attending some celebrations celebrating the marriage of his daughter to Philip II of Spain. This was a weird thing for a lot of reasons. Henry II had actually been held captive by Philip's father during his entire childhood, so there's a lot of trauma associated with that, but anyhow. So he was now celebrating Union of France and Spain together, and during a jousting contest, Henry II ill-advisedly wanted to take part and keep taking part over and over, and there was a jousting accident, and one of the jousting, um, uh, what's it called, joust with a, Lance, thank you. When you go blank in front of a crowd, you really go blank. The lance broke and pierced his visor, went through his orbit and into his brain. But he did not die right away. So he was removed and taken to a sitting in room and Ambrose Pare was brought in and asked, okay, how can we treat the king? Can we possibly save his life? Ambrose Pare did his best and he was helped because Philip II of Spain's court physician Andreas Vesalius was there also, and they both worked on the heads of executed criminals recreating the injury, trying to figure out if there was some way they could deal with this injury and save the king's life. Now, they were unable to. They replicated the injury, they tried to come up with ways to deal with it, the infection inevitably took hold and he died. But what's amazing about this is they replicated the injury, tried to come up with ways to pilot the procedure they would take if they were somehow able to save him, remove the shards of lance from his skull, and try to heal him. So it didn't work, but if I could go back to any one point in history, I'd probably try to be one of the people standing in the background of this room and just see what these guys were up to as they tried to treat the King of France. Now, one other aside, since I've had one already, is some things are ahead of their time. They didn't have imaging to go by, so what did they do? They took the heads of executed criminals and rammed a lance through it in roughly the same direction that the king was injured to try to figure out how it was going. These days, we have 3D CT scans. We can actually 3D print things and plot out surgical approaches to different problems that we have. One other weird surgical procedure that was high fashion at one point and fell out of fashion was grafting. A common punishment for different criminal offenses at the time was cutting someone's nose off. And both in Europe and in India, graft procedures were uh, developed that would take someone's forearm skin, graft it to their face, wait for the vessels to grow in, then they'd cut the skin off the arm and try to craft some kind of a nose out of that graft. This was considered to be so controversial that the uh, physician, or the surgeon rather, who came up with it, uh, Tagliacci, was actually disinterred from a Catholic ceremony and buried in an unmarked grave because it was felt to be such an appalling desecration of the body to do this autograft and re-suture the nose back. Now, had this procedure stuck around, it's entirely possible that we would have come up with autografts much sooner and muscle, pedicle flaps, and things of that nature that are very recent surgical advances. So who's heard of a now, muscle or pedicle flaps and those procedures. Anybody? A couple people? So essentially you take some of the muscle, get its blood supply isolated, 
cut it out, and then suture it back into place somewhere else. The most prominent recent uh, development that really led that to be prominent was treatment for prune belly syndrome. Now that's a condition where people have kidney disorders that are usually more pressing, but if the person can get a kidney transplant, the other problem they have that's very characteristic of that is they have no abdominal muscles. And so the abdominal muscles are absent. And so the uh, person who came up with the uh, procedure to deal with this is called Rolf Gurr. I met him before he died. He was a really nice guy. He took the rectus femoris muscles from the patient, detached them from the knee, flapped them up, and kind of fanned them out onto the rib cage. Now this guy had three of his four quadricep muscles still going to his knee, so he could extend his knee just fine, but he now had his rectus femoris muscles making an abdominal wall. And over time, with therapy, he was able to actually do sit-ups, have a full life, and uh, you know, have good quality of life. But one thing I always thought was interesting is the uh, PT was very challenging immediately because every time he'd try to take a step forward and lift his knee, his rectus femoris muscles would contract and he'd kind of jack his body forward with every single step. <laughs> exactly. But the brain learns, there's plasticity there, it realizes eventually, okay, firing that particular set of axons does not do what I want it to do, I'm going to have to relearn how that goes. All right, I think that's my final weird aside for the evening. So barbers, surgeons, and physicians are all very much in their own little camp. The uh, English physicians and surgeons were relatively segregated from each other until Henry VIII of England, in England at least, charted them all at the same time. Now again, if you're not a history buff, if you're thinking of a famous king of England, you're probably thinking of Henry VIII. He's the one who had all the wives, and basically Henry Tudor chartered the surgeons and the physicians, and that gave them certain rights to practice, and he also had to secure funding for them. So the English surgeons received two bodies per year for public dissection and education. The Scottish surgeons only received one, but they also received the, the whiskey distribution rights to all of Edinburgh. And if you're selling whiskey to Scots, you're in good shape. And so basically they had a good financial source to draw from for education, and they had the occasional body to dissect. But think about it. If you're trying to teach people not only anatomy, but also surgery, is one body per year going to cut it? The answer is no. What's the solution? Grave robbing. There we go. So the University of Edinburgh became, yeah, good job, became a hub for body snatching, grave robbing. Uh, the other term these guys go by is resurrection men, which has a nice ring to it. So essentially, to supply the needs for the teaching, um, teaching of surgery, the teaching of anatomy, people would rob graves. Recently interred people would be dug out of their graves and brought to the surgical theater, dissected, and disposed of. And when I say disposed of, I mean in the most, the most revolting manner possible. Basically just thrown away, dumped in the trash heap, things of that nature. They were not reinterred, anything of that nature. So Scotland, as a hub for body snatching, also became a hub for surgical and anatomical teaching. And the University of Edinburgh became very famous for the teaching of anatomy and surgery. One family actually owned the chair of surgery and anatomy in Edinburgh for 126 years. That was the Monroe family. Monroe Primus, or the first, Alexander Monroe, very famous, very progressive surgeon, had a son who was even better, Alexander Monroe the second. Trained a lot of physicians, did a lot of great research, and sadly, Alexander Monroe the third, Tertius, was an awful, awful teacher. Apparently, people thought he was just a revolting person. He just walked around like with bits of human flesh kind of like stuck to his clothes. He lectured from his grandfather's notes, barely audible, just kind of like droning on. And actually uh, Charles Darwin, I guess, took classes from him and just said that everyone hated him and couldn't understand what he was saying. But he was there because he was a member of a famous family. So people then went to private anatomy schools. That was a thing in medical schools. If you didn't like the anatomy teacher you had, you would go to a private anatomy school. And that's not an advertisement. I'm not opening anything up on 219. <laughs> but these schools could not exist without the process of body snatching. They needed far more cadavers than they would get. 
people did not like the idea that their family members being recently interred would be broken out of their caskets and be on a table within 12 to 8 hours of being interred. So people put up mort safes, cages around the grave that would stay there for a week or two until the body would be far too gone to be able to be dissected. So there's a lot of back and forth between the grave robbers and the people of the town. Several riots broke out. One actually famous riot in New York was brought on by people stealing um, bodies from graves and desecrating the corpses in the eyes of the family. And people were not respectful towards the bodies like we are now. So they had a point. They were not being treated well. Now, if you are an enterprising resurrection man who wants to make bo money by selling bodies to an anatomy school, what's the most efficient way to go about it? Start murdering people. That's exactly what happened with Burke and Hare. So Burke and Hare were two guys in Scotland who were running a boarding house, or basically an inn. And as the story goes, they had a tenant who died with his bill unpaid. They were short of cash. So they said, well, let's just give his body to the anatomy school. And they did. And they got money. They got a lot of money. So they started murdering people who stayed at their inn and selling their bodies to the local anatomy school, which, according to different accounts, either was complicit, was willingly ignorant, or was innocently ignorant of what was going on. But honestly, they had no real reason to. It was in their best interest to look the other way, so they did. Burke and Hare were eventually caught because they kept on murdering well-known local people who would wind up on the table in this surgical school. So Burke and Hare were brought to justice. By the way, Burke and Hare has been turned into a hilarious comedy movie starring Simon Pegg and Andy Serkis. It's actually kind of funny, so check it out. <laughs> a little morbid. So Hare turned state's evidence against Burke and basically testified against him in exchange for his life, and Burke was put to death, and in a delicious twist of irony, his skeleton was dissected by the surgeons. Its, its skeleton still stands in the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh today, and his skin was used to bind several books, and we can see one of them right there. So that was his posthumous penalty for murdering people for anatomy. So take a deep breath, yeah, I agree, take a deep breath. It's only going to get better. So Scotland had become a major hub for anatomical and surgical research. And that really became apparent in the lives of William and especially John Hunter, who were both Scotsmen who emigrated to London and became the major force for surgical innovation in the Victorian era. Now, surgery was still seen as manual labor. It was seen as something that was non-intellectual, a craft art. That changed in England during the lifetime of John Hunter because of John Hunter. He took a fanatical devotion to anatomical research, publishing, investigation, and improving surgery through anatomy, and basically pulled surgery into respectability. Now, the only way I can really convey this, and I've tried to come up with a few metaphors, has anyone here been an EMT? Got a few. As an EMT, would you say your contributions to healthcare are valued and honored by those around you and society at large? No. I, someone's being very nice in the back, so eh, kind of. Now, ENTs are good people. They try to keep us alive and get us to the hospital. They're doing good work. Yet, there's this underlying air of distrust from the public at large, mostly unearned, that's where surgery was back in this day. You did not go to a surgeon if you could help it. It was a last resort, and it was not somebody you were especially keen on kind of going to visit, because you were probably going to die. So in the lifetime of John Hunter, surgery went from that sort of unnecessary social mm, kind of disapproval to becoming what it is now. When you say to somebody, oh, my son or daughter is going to become a surgeon, that sounds good now, right? Back in the day, that, sounds, that was a consolation prize. So we have John Hunter to thank for that switch. His brother, William, had already gone through uh, medical school, become a surgeon. He was uh, an OB-GYN 
and opened up an anatomy school in addition to his practice in London. And it became very popular. William was actually a really good physician and very socially capable, very good at networking. And he started to run out of time to teach. So he brought his brother John down to London to help him teach. John was a fantastic scientist, very natural scientist, but he had no interest in academic learning. He flunked out of university within a couple weeks because he hated going to class. He just wanted to walk around the fields and see, look at the animals, look at the leaves, try to figure out how things worked on his own. And because he was not academically gifted, he did what Paré did. He joined the army, became a military surgeon, got practical experience, traveled around, and when he came back, he had enough background to go into training at various English hospitals. So once he came back, he traveled through different hospitals, trained with the luminaries of the age, guys like William Cheseldon, who was a very well-known lithotomist, making bladder and kidney stone removal, something that was no longer quite so horrific, as well as Percival Pott, who was basically an early orthopedist, treating fractures and trying to figure out ways to get fractures both um, closed and open to be able to heal a bit better. So he was already feeling a little bit of an experimental vibe in the air from his training, and he took that and ran with it. So Hunter, once he started at his brother's anatomy school and eventually opened his own, worked for roughly 19 hours a day, dissecting, writing, teaching, visiting patients. He really didn't like practice as much as he liked research, but he had to do it to make sure that he had enough money coming in to support the staggering number of bodies he was paying resurrection men to bring to his house. And this was all done out of his house. His personal residence was a teaching school in addition to being where he lived. So he essentially would research nonstop, looking for different ways to understand disease and heal it and come up with different procedures. He played lots of money to get lots of bodies for he and his students to work on, to dissect, to investigate. And he would stop at nothing to get specimens that he found especially interesting. The most stereotypical John Hunter story, and there are lots, is a story of the Irish giant, a guy named Charles Byrne. Charles Byrne was somebody suffering from a pituitary tumor. He had gigantism. And back in the day, if you were an illiterate Irish peasant who had gigantism, and you had a lot of pain as a result of that uncontrolled growth, you couldn't really work manually, what would you do to make a living? Yeah, you'd show yourself publicly. You'd be basically join the circus, you'd go around, people would come look at you and give you money. That was actually, he actually made a fairly decent amount of money in that way. So people kind of uh, displaying themselves publicly was a valid way to make a living back in the day. It was still suspect, not high culture, but it worked. He had a lot of health problems and he knew he was going to die young and he'd made arrangements for his burial. However, prior to his dying, William Hunter came to him, and, or John Hunter, pardon me, came to him and said, listen, you are fascinating. I need your body when you die because I want to dissect you. And it's probably exactly that much tact as he used in the actual conversation. Hunter was not renowned for being socially skilled. Charles Byrne was a very devout Catholic, believed that his body had to be intact on the day of resurrection or else he was done for. So he was horrified at the very thought of being dissected. So he took his money from displaying himself and bought a stone coffin that was going to be thrown into the sea, specifically so that John Hunter could not steal his body and dissect him. After he died, John Hunter counter-bribed the mortician <laughs> followed them to the sea, and while the funeral party was at an inn, getting, you know, sleeping for the night, they swapped out his body with a bunch of rocks, and within an hour, he was in John Hunter's carriage going back to London, and there's his skeleton, still there in the Hunterian Museum to this day. Now, in addition to shadily procured human specimens, John Hunter would dissect anything. Any menagerie or zoo in the London area that had animals, he let them know that when those animals died, he wanted them. He wanted to be able to dissect them and investigate them. The whale that's there, the, the monograph he wrote on whale anatomy was actually the inspiration for Moby Dick. Who's read Moby Dick? Did it ever seem weird to you that there was a spot right in the middle where he did this long 
diatribe on whale anatomy? Guess so? Okay. Moby Dix is kind of a tough read anyway. But yeah, that's all because of John Hunter. Herman Melville was very inspired by John Hunter's description of whale anatomy and threw that into Moby Dick. This room is not a museum. That is John Hunter's house. <laughs> His house was literally a museum where people would come to see him. Nothing? Yeah, I don't know. It really was a scream? The Adams Family? Okay, that was the opening of the Adams Family. But his house literally was a museum. He found, or he was instrumental in founding the Veterinary College of London. He worked with dentists. Now, he was not somebody who cared a lot about social distinction, and he talked with dentists. If you think surgeons had low status back then, dentists were way, way lower down. Yet he thought teeth were fascinating. And when we talk about teeth, incisors, canines, cuspids, bicuspids, that terminology was from Hunter. He came up with that terminology to describe teeth and how they manifest not only in humans but throughout different animals, throughout different phyla. Oops. So he had not only this museum, he had a country house, and he had all kinds of exotic animals running around his property in the country. Uh, funny enough, the guy who wrote Dr. Doolittle lived a few miles away, and it's thought that John Hunter was also the inspiration for Dr. Doolittle, who had all the animals and could talk to all the animals. So he investigated mastodon teeth. He had a, you know, he put forward the opinion that mastodons were actually different from elephants and they had gone extinct. At the time, extinction was something that was thought not to be possible. And he submitted a paper to the Royal College of Surgeons basically saying that evolution was something that really happened based on his examination of skeletal um, um, remains in different phyla. It was held back for 70 years and not published until after Charles Darwin had submitted his theory of evolution because it was thought to be too controversial. The Royal College of Surgeons basically rushed it out after Darwin published to say like, hey, Hunter figured this out too. Now, Hunter was brilliant, but he, he came up with the idea of evolution, but lots of people had done that prior to Darwin. What Darwin did was come up with the idea of natural selection as the driving force behind evolution. So Hunter's brilliant, but he does not dim Darwin's brilliance by any means. So he also did a lot of auto-experimentation. At the time, one major controversy was whether syphilis and gonorrhea were one disease that manifested in a variety of ways or two separate diseases. And if you had a venereal disease back then, prior to antibiotics, you probably had a couple. You didn't have just one. You likely had a few at the same time. So Hunter decided he needed to figure out whether syphilis and gonorrhea were one disease or, the, or two. So he found a, a sailor in a bar who had syphilis, and he said, yeah, can I get some of the syphilitic pustules off the tip of your penis? And he did, and he infected himself with syphilis and tracked the progression of the disease. And he came to the conclusion that syphilis and gonorrhea were the same disease, probably because the sailor had both, and Hunter had inadvertently infected himself with both. He... Uh, talked a lot about wound healing. He actually had his own Achilles tendon rupture, and instead of falling to the ground and going to, the, to another doctor like a sane person, he started describing what the symptoms were like, then he started lacerating other tendons of other animals to see how wound healing and tendon healing occurred. And he died as he lived. He'd been having angina, chest pain, lightness of, uh, you know, kind of just kind of loss of consciousness and knew he was probably going to die of a heart-related condition. And when he had a myocardial infarction during an argument at the hospital where he was working, instead of trying to calm down, he ran to a mirror and started writing down his symptoms as they appeared and died of a massive heart attack as he stood there at the mirror. So the thing about Hunter that's amazing is he did a huge amount for surgical research, a huge amount of bringing anatomy and surgery together in a huge variety of ways, yet he was completely amoral. It was a really strange combination of characteristics at a time when people could actually get away with things like that. There are probably people today who would do all this stuff if they could, but are no longer enjoying the freedom to just steal people's bodies at will. So it's a very strange combination of characteristics, and it's really hard to say what the final verdict on Hunter is, but his brilliance cannot be doubted even if his morals are utterly suspect. <laughs>
Now we'll finish off with one last jump back in time. We talked about how the surgeons in England were chartered but did not achieve respectability until John Hunter brought better outcomes and better basis for their practice in England. In France, it happened all at once. And it happened all at once because King Louis XIV had an anal fistula. Now again, if you're not a big history buff, if you're thinking of a famous king of France, you're probably thinking of Louis XIV. So Louis XIV, the Sun King, had utter misery medically for most of his life. Lots of different diseases, almost certainly many venereal diseases, but amongst the problems he had was an anal fistula. And if anyone doesn't know, an anal fistula is when an infection basically burrows its way from the anus into the rectum and you basically have another route for purulent fecal material connecting the inside to the outside, very painful, eventually gonna cause sepsis and eventually gonna kill you. The king decided he wanted to have surgery to cure his anal fistula and he brought the court surgeon who was basically terrified at this prospect in. So Charles Francois Felix had to come up with a way to cut out the king's anal fistula and not kill the king in the process. So Felix did a lot of anal fistula surgeries on peasants. And I've read varying accounts of whether or not these people even had anal fistulas before he did the surgery on them. So none of them survived. No one survived these experimental surgeries to see how to actually go about cutting around the anus, suturing it back up. But the time came, the king had to be operated on, and he did. And the king survived. Now, one reason I think the king survived in an era of pre-anesthesia and pre-germ theory is basically that if you are going to cut open the king of France, what are you going to do to your instruments first? you're gonna clean them. They're actually gonna be relatively hygienic. They're gonna be cleaned off, unlike any of the procedures he probably did in preparation for it. So the king survived, and Felix was immediately made a baron. The king said, oh, surgeons do good work. They are hereby immediately chartered. There are now schools of surgery in all the French universities, and we need to have surgeons attached to all military units. So that respectability came instantaneously in France, basically due to one procedure on one person. And it worked, because the surgeons were actually able to do fairly good work. They actually went into the field with the soldiers and were able to do a variety of treatments. This was after Paré, so people knew how to do ligatures. They knew how to actually treat and amputate in a way that people were not going to necessarily die, provided they survived the post-surgical infection, which we still didn't know anything about. And they stayed there until the French Revolution and the term health officer replaced all physicians and surgeons throughout the entire country of France. All right, now, despite be gaining an anatomical basis, despite being more socially acceptable, surgery was still horrifically brutal. You had no anesthesia apart from possibly ice, a little bit of morphine, possibly alcohol was used, but none of that makes the pain stop. It just dulls it a bit. And even if you get through the surgery, this horrifically painful process, no idea of what germ theory is. So you're likely going to die from the massive infection that takes hold and spreads thereafter. And the changes to that happened relatively quickly. And we're gonna follow that starting tomorrow, five o'clock, as we go through the introduction of surgical anesthesia and antiseptic procedures. All right, thank you all very much. Always feels weird stopping halfway through, but there we go. Oh, well, I'm here. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. Which war it was they introduced the tourniquet? No. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to look into that. I think tourniquet as a possible procedure has been around for a long time, but in terms of actual mandating, this is how you treat a bleeding limb, I really don't know. It was known at least in the 1500s because prior to amputating, people would try to clamp down on the major arteries in, on a limb prior to cutting it off. All right, thank you. <laughs>